If you've lived in East Texas very long, you've seen a storm or two, haven't you? Uh, you've seen some violent thunder and lightning storms. You know, you, you, you've seen those storms where the, the thunder rolls, where your, your, your windows shake and, and it rattles your house and it'll roll from sometimes 10 seconds or more, it seems like. Uh, I've seen lightning storms. I'm sure you have. When I lived in Fort Worth, I, uh, you can really see a long ways in Fort Worth. And I've seen lightning storms that were almost as good as the 4th of July fireworks, you know, uh, they're popping everywhere, lighting up the sky, it coming straight down, uh, doing all kind of damages. But, um, you know, storms are pretty normal for us in uh, East Texas. Um, I grew up in Southeast Texas, down in Bo the Beaumont area. And uh, if you live in the Southeast Texas, uh, you, you get used to uh, all kinds of storms. Hurricanes, you know, uh, we get used to tornadoes, thunder and lightning. But there's one I, I kind of like. I like those tropical storms that just kind of come in and rain. That's good sleeping weather, isn't it? <laughs> Especially if you have a tin roof. I mean, you know, it just kind of rains on you and uh, for a couple of days. And, and, and it doesn't wash anything out. It doesn't flood. It just kind of waters and soaks everything. It's a great rain. But but kind of used to um, uh, storms. I had a, a, a couple that we became kind of short-term friends with when I was in seminary. They moved here from... Uh, the uh, northwest coast, and they weren't used to the storms like this. And I remember the first time we had a, a lightning thunderstorm, and we got the, the horns went off in Fort Worth, and, and uh, we all had to run for shelter. And their, their son was playing with our son, and uh, they come running down to get him, and they had never seen anything like it. It scared them all to death. Next thing I know, they're moving back home. <laughs> you know, we just kind of get used to storms. and. I used to go to bed and not worry about the storms, but I've had some experiences, and now I don't do that. Um, now, have you ever watched a storm roll in? You've been on the lake. You can see a long ways, you know, and you see that dark, dark, dark storm roll in. Have you ever had one that rolled in that just had a different hue to it? It, it was just darker than most. It was one of those storms that, man, you could almost smell it before it got there. And, and you go, that, that's different. That, that, that's a little scary. That, that's one, you know, maybe we need to get inside kind of storms. You know, the definition of a storm is a violent disturbance, usually associated with weather, but a storm can also be a violent disturbance in your life. Don't we use the word storm? The Bible often yet time talks about storms. We, we, storms in our life can be a, a violent disturbance that has nothing to do with the weather at all, but has everything to do with our personal life. See, God uses storms of both types. Sometimes those storms are designed to grow your faith. Sometimes they grow you closer to God. Sometimes they bring you to repentance. Sometimes they prepare you for ministry, and other times they help you to understand God more intimately. See, God uses all kinds of storms in your life to do a work in you. And that's what I want to talk tonight. I want to talk to you tonight about how God uses storms in our life uh, and the life of the disciples in this, this text and how he uses those same kind of storms in our life today, just like he did in their storms then. So let's stand as we honor the reading of God's word. I'm going to be reading uh, verses 22 through um, 33, and then we'll break this text down. It said, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened. And beginning to seek, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand, took hold of him, and said to him, You of little faith, why do you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly 
God's Son. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your word would penetrate our hearts, Father, that you would teach us what you want to teach us, that you would speak to us about those things you want to speak to us. Father, that you'd have freedom to move in this room, and each one of us have a different need, and maybe to understand this in their own personal context differently. But we pray, God, that your word would speak to us, and that when we leave this place, we would know you better, more intimately. And we would understand what you're doing in our life when those storms come. And we would not fear or be afraid, but that we would trust you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In, in chat, one thing when you're reading the scriptures, just a little side note, when you read the scriptures, when you want to understand what's being said in a paragraph, uh, if you have a, have a Bible that has paragraphs, if you want to understand what's in that story or what's in that part of the text, it's really good to know what's before it and what's after it. And it kind of explains, it'll kind of show you because when they write, they don't write like us. We kind of write chronologically. They write in a way that explains things for you to understand certain things. And it's all textually tied together. So when you look at chapter 14, what you find is, is that John the Baptist has been in prison and uh, Herod lops his head off, and Jesus has just found out about his death. And he tries to go off to be by himself. He goes, wants to go off and grieve, most likely, pray, maybe go off and pray and spend some time with his father. And the crowds are there. The crowds are just following him, these massive crowds of people that are need healing, and, and they're looking for the Messiah, and they're struggling, and they're having difficulty in their life, and, and they're looking for Jesus to do a miracle in their life, and so they're following him around, and even though he's trying to grieve, he's trying to get alone by himself, he looks at him, and in the text it says he had compassion. By the way, I think compassion is something that we've lost in the church in many ways today. For us to look out there at the lost and look out there at the people that are hurting and struggling and that don't know Christ and have compassion on them. Well, Jesus had compassion on them. He didn't say, well, you know what? I'm busy. Uh, John the Baptist just died. I need to be alone. Go away. Leave me alone. He didn't do that. He had compassion and he began to heal them. He began to heal the sick. And in that passage, that's what we want to think of as he fed the 5,000. But, but what Jesus is trying to do in this passage is to teach them to trust him. He's trying to grow their faith and teach them to trust him in that passage because that he, he does this great miracle. Remember, he says, he says the, the disciples come to Jesus and says, you know what? They're all hungry and we're in the middle of nowhere and they're, they're, there's no brooks or grocery anywhere near and we can't feed them. We need to send everybody away because they're hungry. And you know what? We're hungry too. And Jesus says, don't send them away. You feed them. Can you imagine the disciples? They don't, got, they don't have anything to feed them with. They can't go to the grocery store. I doubt they got enough money to feed 5,000 men plus women and children. And Jesus looks at them and says, you feed them. You feed them. They said, we don't have any way to feed them. We only have five loaves of bread. And their loaves of bread were like these little bitty loaves. And probably two little fish about that big that may have been pickled or something. That's all I got. He said, give it to me. They hand it to Jesus and he blesses it. He breaks it. And you know the story. They feed all these people. And in the very end, there's 12 baskets of food left over. One for each disciple. What do you think you would have, if you would have been there, what if you would have been one of the disciples? How do you think you would have received that? What do you think you would have done? I think it would have been astounding. Jesus just did something impossible. He asked the disciples to do something impossible, which was the point. You can't do what I'm telling you to do, but I can't. And Jesus shows them this miracle and shows them something impossible to teach them to have faith and trust him. And then we come to the next section, which is what she's doing, the same thing. And it says, immediately he made disciples get in the boat and go ahead to him to the other side. And he sent the crowds away. Immediately. 
It was like, okay, I'm done. We, we fed everybody. It's time for everybody to go away. And then Jesus goes up on the, the mountainside, and he spends time with the Father in prayer. Can you imagine? He's been grieving. He's been healing. He's been doing this all day. And he goes on the mountainside to pray and spend time with God. And he sends the disciples in a boat. And it says, when they'd gone far off, this terrible storm came up and interrupted their cruise. Jesus most assuredly knew there was a storm coming. If you'll read Matthew chapter 8, you'll see that there's the story where Jesus is in the boat asleep with the disciples and they're all scared. And he says, we're going to die. And he goes, what are you worried about? Be still. And it's done. Jesus had already proven that he controlled the weather. The weather doesn't control itself. See, sometimes we're so scientifically minded that we can't see God working where he works. So God is in control of the storm. Jesus knew there was a storm. There's no doubt. So you have to ask yourself, why did Jesus send the disciples in a boat out into the sea when there was going to be this terrible storm arise? It says it was against them. So the wind was blowing in their face. They weren't going to be sailing straight forward. They were being tossed to and fro. This is the only story that's told in all four Gospels. Pretty important story. Why did he send them into the storm when he knew there would be a storm? And there's no doubt that Jesus had a specific purpose. Otherwise, we wouldn't be reading about it in the Scriptures. It's in here because it's significant. There's something about this story. There was something God was doing in the lives of his disciples that was important enough for you and I to read about it today so that we can learn from it also. So the first thing I want you to see is the reason for the storm. Listen, guys, God often uses storms to grow your faith in him. God often uses storms to grow your faith in him. Now, he uses all kinds of storms. We already talked about that. And I got a series that talks about that. I go through each one of those kinds of storms that he uses in order to grow you. He used one in Jonah's life and Abraham's life and Isaac's life. I mean, all the great men of faith, there's a storm somewhere that was brewing. And God used every one of them to grow their faith. Sometimes he brought them back to repentance. You, jo, Jonah, remember Jonah? Jonah was told to go this way and he went that way. And so God caused a storm and then he got thrown overboard, got swallowed by a fish. And guess where he went next? That's a storm of correction. But in this particular story, this is a storm of faith. This is a storm of, 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 of growing their, their walk with him. So see, guys, I want you to understand, storms are not meant to destroy you or discourage you. See, Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy, not Jesus. See, oftentimes what we want to do is if it's good for me, then God sent this. If it's bad for me, then, then Satan sent it. Quit giving Satan credit for what God's trying to do in your life. Sometimes you get in a storm and it's right where God sent you. Now, certainly there are times that you go through disciplining because you, you did something to yourself. <laughs> But when God is working your life and he sends a storm in your life, he sent that storm with a purpose. And Satan's not messing with you. God is growing you. God is moving in you. God is doing something in your life. And that ought to encourage you because you're going, God's doing something in my life? I didn't even know who, God knew who I was. I'm just a, a period on the end of a sentence in this place. I'm nothing. I'm insignificant. But God loves me, and he is doing something in my life so that I will know him better. I'll trust him more. Something, whatever that storm is, God's going to let you know you're not going to miss it. How do you respond to the storm? So God often uses storms to grow your faith. He doesn't discourage you. He doesn't destroy you. That's Satan's job. He builds you up. That's what God does. He builds us up. So he immediately sent them out in this boat, into this headlong 
terrifying storm. In the text, there's a few things we know about the, storm, about the time of the storm. It was 4 o'clock in the morning, somewhere between 4 and 6 in the morning. So they had worked all day, fed everybody, got in a boat, got out into the ocean far enough that they got halfway out there. The storm hits, and it's early in the morning. I don't know about you, but about 9.30, about all I can make it. <laughs> Last night, Julie and I were like, she's like, I don't think I can stay up any longer. What time is it? It's 7.30. You know, I mean, can you imagine being up all night? How tired they were? How often do you go through storms and you are tired? You are wore out. You have no strength in and of yourself. It's right where God wants you. That's where he wants you. He doesn't want you able to do it on yourself. They had, they've been fighting against this storm all night. They've been trying to get to the other side. It says the wind was fierce. It was blowing straight in their face. They were tired, cold, and wet. And then the darkness. Can you imagine the darkness? You know, dark seems to make everything scarier. You know, if it's daytime and you're at home and you hear a noise, you don't really think much of it, do you? But two o'clock in the morning, a little noise wakes you up. It's Freddy Krueger. Right? When I was a little boy, I would spend the night with my mamma Johnson. That's my mom's mom. And she had an older house, and it, it had those bathtubs in it that were cast iron. And you would take a bath in a cast iron, and it, it heats up, you know. But then you go to bed, and it starts to cool down, and you hear pop, pop, boom. And I'm, I'm scared to death. <laughs> Hearing those noises, the dark, always seems to make everything scarier. And then Jesus came walking in them on the water. But look what the disciples saw. The disciples went, oh, it's a ghost. It's a ghost. They let their imagination run wild with fear that overcame them. How often do you go through a storm and you've been in it a while and you're tired and it's dark and it's painful and it's hard and you can't see God working at all and you let your mind run wild and the next thing you know, it's all terrible. It's all going to end bad. Nothing good's going to happen. It's all, you know, God's nowhere. He don't know where I am. I guess I'm the only one been there. Or you got a good game face. You got on the internet and you check things out and, oh my gosh, I've got some dreaded disease that you can't have unless you've been to some foreign country somewhere. But I got it. When you let your mind run wild, when you're tired and when it's dark and when you've been in this fight for a long time, sometimes you can let your imagination, you can let your mind run wild. And generally when it runs wild, you go to a negative place. You go to a bad place instead of a place of faith and trust and believing God is going to come through and God is going to do something impossible. Impossible. In verse 27, Jesus showed up in the midst of the storm, walking on the water. And what does he say? Do not be afraid. That's like your daddy giving you a spanking. You're standing there crying. He says, shut that crying up. I'll give you something to cry about. But you just spanked me. None of y'all had that happen. Only my dad, I'm sure. I know none of the, well. Listen to this. When you guys read the scriptures, this isn't everything, but God told Joshua, do not be afraid. He's fixing to fight a battle that he had never fought before. He, he was a slave. He was not, he was not a seasoned a military guy. Don't be afraid, Joshua. Trust me, Joshua. I'm going to fight your battle for you. He told Isaiah, do not be afraid. He told the disciples not only here, but in chapter 17, he told uh, Peter, James, and John on the, on the Mount of Transfiguration, do not be afraid. Because he's with us. Church, there's no need for you to be afraid because Jesus is here. Do not be afraid. Let me say, I used to think God's way out there when I was a young person, real young. God's way out there somewhere. That, see, because heaven's way out there somewhere. 
But when you understand that Jesus is here, He's wherever you go. He's everywhere because He lives inside of all of those of us who are His. Wherever you go, you take Him with you. Good, bad, and indifferent. Wherever you go, you're taking Him with you. And when you're in that storm, guess where He is? Right with you. In the storm. And guess what? He controls the storm, doesn't He? He can bring it. He can stop it. He controls it. And it's not to destroy you. It's not to discourage you. It's to build you up. So how do we allow storms to grow our faith and not increase our fear? How do we, in real life, on Monday morning, let's say Thursday morning, because that's tomorrow, how do we allow these storms to grow our faith and not increase our fear? By understanding God, growing your faith is about learning how to walk with Jesus. You need to understand, that's what I want you to get out of this. I want you to understand that those storms are meant to teach you how to walk with Jesus. You can't walk with Jesus if you don't believe. You can't walk with Jesus if you don't trust him. You can't walk with him if you haven't put your faith and trust in him. You can't walk with him. See, because when Jesus calls you into a relationship with himself, he says, come follow me. I guess that's what I mean. He doesn't stay still. Wherever he goes, you're supposed to follow him. So you're going to walk with him. Isn't that what he was really teaching all of his people when the 40 years of being in the desert? He was trying to teach them to walk with him. They just were kind of hard-headed. They were an obstinate people. Thank goodness we're not. Maybe those churches in Alabama, Oklahoma for sure, but certainly not Flint Baptist Church. We're not hard-headed. We follow Jesus because we trust him. We put our faith in him. When we know he can do the impossible, he can do things that you can't even imagine Or think. So walking with God's this faith issue. Guys, and we often fear. How many many of you, don't raise your hand. How many of you admit that you have a tendency to fear when you're in the storm? You have a tendency to go to fear or the negative place or, or you can't see how God will ever work this thing out where it's in your favor. Or... Maybe you thought before you got in here that Satan was messing with you and God had nothing to do with it. How often do we walk in fear and not in faith? How often do we we let fear overtake us and so that we really struggle with this trusting God thing? Notice what Peter does. Peter says, command me to come. So Jesus said, come on. Have you ever noticed that he's the only one that got out of the boat? Why did all those other knuckleheads stay in the boat? They didn't even have the faith that Peter had. To even ask to get out of the boat. There's a great study, a Bible study that John Oakberg has. Because if you want to walk on water... You got to get out of the boat. If you want to do something great for God, you got to get out of the boat. You got to leave safety. You got to be okay with if God doesn't come through, I'm going to fall flat on my face. Isn't that what David cried out oftentimes in the Psalms? God, if you don't rescue me, they're going to kill me. But even if they, you, they do, I trust you. Watch it. Go read the Psalms. It said, Come. Peter gets out. He walks on the water. Peter was willing to leave the safety and security of the boat as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus. But notice what the text says. He he, he did one of these numbers. And he began to see the waves and the storm and the wind. And he took his eyes off Jesus just enough and he began to sink. And he was looking at Jesus. Then he looked at the waves and he began to be afraid. Jesus took, Peter took his eyes off Jesus. 
And the storm caused him to fear, caused him to sink. Guys, listen to me. Storms are good for us because they cause us to realize we can't save ourselves. And it forces us to trust God by keeping our eyes focused on Jesus. Listen, if you focus your eyes on Jesus, if you get in his word and focus on his word, if you believe his word is true, and when you go through a storm or you go through a difficulty, you go through something, what you need to do is go find the scriptures that speak to that and trust the scriptures, not your eyes. Not what everybody else is telling you. Not what normally happens. We need to trust his word. We need to focus our eyes on Jesus and keep them focused on Jesus because when you take your eyes off Jesus and put them onto the storm, you sink. You begin to drown. Now, if some of you were honest, you would say, yeah, I've been there. I've been so deep in the storm and I was up to here in the water. I was drowning. I couldn't breathe. I didn't know what to do. I panicked. I was in fear. I ran, I pleaded with God, I did everything but keep my eyes focused on Jesus. Storms are good for us because they grow us. It helps us to learn how to leave that safety and security of the boat. Listen, guys, I I like safety and security. I, I like knowing where I'm at. I like knowing what I'm doing. And, and for God to tell me, okay, I, you get out there and do something that you're not comfortable with. Go Get outside of your box. Let me tell you what, when I first went into ministry, my box was about that big. <laughs> I'm not joking you. It was really about that big. <clears throat> when I realized that I was in a class and my professor was out and he sent his wife into the class. Now, my professor is six foot four and looks and talks and acts like a professor. But his wife acts and talks like a 70s hippie child. (laughs) They're totally opposite. She's, I'm not kidding you, she's bouncing around the room and she's doing all this stuff and I'm going, oh my goodness. And so she calls us up to the front on the little stage in this big classroom. And she says, I'm going to teach you guys how to pray a different way. And what I want you to do is I want somebody to voice your need, a prayer request. And then I want two or three people just to start praying for you. And when you're done, then somebody else can give a prayer request and two or three people can pray for you. Well, I don't know about you, but that's not orderly enough for me. So, A lot of the younger ones were all up in that, and I was kind of standing back, and I was kind of leaning against the table, and my heart's pounding, and my hands are sweating, and I'm like, this is really weird. (laughs) And I was really nervous. And the Lord spoke to my heart while I was saying, he said, why are you so nervous? What's wrong with you? See, God put me in that very uncomfortable situation to teach me something about myself. And so when he spoke to me and he had that little conversation in my head, I stepped up and got in the crowd and participated. And it still wasn't normal for me, but I was so uncomfortable. Isn't that the way it is in life when God says, hey, I want you to do something different. I want you to do something new. I want want you to go here. I want you to go there. And how oftentimes do we have a little argument with God? I don't know about you, but I've never won one. I don't know that I've ever won an argument at all. I might have thought I did, but then the storm came. (laughs) See, God does those things in our life to grow us. He puts you in uncomfortable places. He puts you somewhere that's not your norm. It's outside your box. He puts you in places that makes you grow. There was a time you would have never got me on the stage. My wife sitting back there, she'll tell you. I, was, uh, I got a shy streak a half a mile long. I don't like being in front of people. My heart pounds. I hand sweat. 
I'm going, God, are you sure? (laughs) God says, you know why he does that? Oftentimes because he wants you to give him all the glory. Because you can't do it. No matter how great you think you are, no matter how great I think I am, I can't do anything of any eternal importance. So these storms are good for us. They, they grow us. They're painful sometimes, and they don't feel good, and sometimes they're outside our box. Sometimes we don't like them, and sometimes they put us in dark places and go on longer than we want them to go, but oftentimes I think they go on longer than we want them to go because some people, no one in here, are hard-headed. I'm sure none of you are hard-headed. It takes you a little longer to learn what God wants you to know, what he wants you to grow. I often pray, God, I'm listening. And, and hurry up. <laughs> Please. Peter takes his eyes off Jesus. He begins to sink. And he realizes, I can't save myself. And he puts his hand up and Jesus is right there. He grabs him and pulls him up. And the next instant, they're in the boat. Isn't that cool? I'm wondering, how did Jesus walk on the water with all those waves like that? How did Peter even do it? And they were in the boat. Guys, listen, keeping your eyes on Jesus means knowing Jesus has authority over your storm and he's more powerful than what you're facing. There's another way of saying it. God is sovereign over you and that storm, and what you're facing, and what you're going through, no matter what it is, no matter what the doctors have said, no no matter what your accountant has said, no matter what your wife, or your family, or your husband has said, he is bigger, and badder, and has authority over everything, including you, including me. Man, that is so freeing, when I understand that God's God isn't just out there letting all this stuff happen and it just kind of works itself out. I hate that term. Oh, it'll just work out. No, it won't. God has a plan. And what he plans will take place. We got to quit walking through life like that. Well, it'll just all work out. It doesn't just all work out. He works everything out. And for your good. Listen, without storms that build our faith, we can often become lazy and complacent in our walk with God. There's Everybody in this room can probably say there's been a point in your life you became complacent and lazy with God. You quit reading your Bible. You quit praying. You quit serving. You quit giving. You, you just kind of went off and did your own thing for a little while. And then God sent a storm and brought you back. Something happened in your life that brought you back. Everyone in here at some point has become complacent. Become lazy and become, I don't really care. or I really don't have any energy to it. I'm not excited about that. I'm not excited about Jesus. I'm not excited about his word. I'm not excited about reaching the laws. I'm not excited about serving God's church and his people. And you become complacent or lazy. Then God sends these storms. And when these storms come, and it gets tough and it's dark and, it, and, and you come to the end of yourself and you figure out, I can't fix it. It causes us to pray, doesn't it? When do you pray the most? When everything is go lucky and the bank's full and you're doing great? Or when there's a storm? When you're struggling, when something's out there, when something's happening in your life, you, you, you pray harder, you pray more fervently, you pray more earnestly, you pray more often, and then you begin to study God's word more, and you begin to intensely study his word, intensely pray, and we trust him to save us. Oh God, please save me, please help me, I need your help because I can't do this. We need those storms. 
It's often in those storms of life that we best learn how to walk with God. It's when we're waiting on the doctor to call with those test results. Or when we've heard there's going to be layoffs at the, at the office. Or when your child's sick. I don't know about you, but I never did well when Aaron was sick. Now I've got these two grandkids, I know I'm not going to do well. Or when your marriage hasn't been good in years. You're just kind of living as friends. It's in these storms you realize that you can't save yourself. That you need God. And He's real and He's right there with you. And He's willing. And Jesus shows us when we're most tired and most afraid and it's so dark that everything looks impossible. He's there. So Jesus uses storms to teach you you can trust him no matter how dark it gets or how stormy your life becomes. No matter how long the storm rages, you can trust God. Notice the storm didn't stop until Jesus and Peter got back in the boat. The the storm didn't stop when Jesus grabs Peter's hand. The storm didn't stop when Peter says, hey, Bid me to come to you. The storm was still when Peter learned to walk with Jesus. Look at verse 33. Look what it says there. It gives us a great picture of what Jesus was teaching in totality. And those that were in the boat worshiped him saying, you are certainly God's son. You are certainly God's son. It's through the storm that the disciples believed. Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the very moment in Scripture that we see that the disciples understood that who Jesus is. He'd done miracles. He'd done all these things. But they really didn't understand who he was until this very moment. They realized he truly is the Son of God. Do you truly believe he is the Son of God? The last time I preached this text in a sermon series about storms, I had no idea what God was about to do in our lives. 2016, in late January, I began a series on storms. This was one of those texts. Now, this wasn't the exact sermon, but it is one of the texts that I preach on how God used storms. And so what I wanted to do is take the storms that you see in the scriptures and the different kinds of storms, the storms of correction and storms of repentance, and, and, and preach through those texts and encourage our people. Until on February the 2nd, after I preached two of these, February 2nd, 2016, at 3.30 in the afternoon, Julie and I were watching the news because there were some really bad storms coming through Mississippi. If y'all don't know, I was pastoring in Mississippi back then. And usually those storms would come and turn, and they would generally turn and go straight east if you'll remember, there was one that came and it was like five miles away from our house. It turned, went straight east, and really damaged Tuscaloosa, Alabama a whole lot. I think that was 2015. On this day, the news said Collinsville, that's the town we were in, you got five minutes. So I looked at Julie and I said, I think we ought to go get in our safe place. And she goes, I think you're right. And so we grabbed our son and our Labrador, and we ran over to the church, and we got in a building that was cinder block. It was two-story, and we got in the building, and we crawled underneath a credenza, and about the time we shut the door to the building, we could hear it hit outside. The tornado had hit the church straight on. And for about 30 seconds or less, we heard pit, pat, boom, boom, bing, bang, just these noises. And it quit. And I remember thinking, well, if that's all we got, that's not too bad. So I come out of the door, and there's green pine straw everywhere. And I come out the hallway, and I look down the hallway, and the glass doors are blown out. And I said out loud, if this is all we got, ah, we we did okay. I come out the end of the building, I turn around and looked, and the second story of the building we were in was gone. 
like nowhere to be found gone. Then I looked at the children's building and the, the youth building, which are those two buildings you see there, and they are open like a can opener. Roof's gone. Building's destroyed. The sanctuary was this old sanctuary that had wooden beams. We just made it twice the size so we could fit, seat 600 people. Just did it. And it was wooden beams that come down, a heavy roof. It lifted the roof off of the building and set it back down. I had an aeronautical engineer tell me there's no way that happened. I took him around to the side of the building and showed him where a downspout was inside the building. He said, well, I guess it did happen. <laughs> Little did I know what God was about to do in the midst of these storms. Now, I will tell you that my church asked me to preach on sunshine. No more storm. But the immediate, the immediate reaction of the church was to ask me, why did God allow something like this to happen? And the truth of the matter is, I didn't have an answer for him in that moment. I remember that morning we prayed. I was at the Piggly Wiggly. We were getting a cup of coffee. A group of guys said the storms were coming, so we prayed over it. And, and uh, so 42 houses were, were, were messed up by the same, but nobody got injured. So we, God answered that prayer. But why did it happen? Initially, there was a lot of panic and a lot of fear. But in just a little bit, just in a week or two, God began to change that. He began to turn that around. And I began to see people grow in their faith. And, and, and I began to see God teaching them and teaching us as a church to trust him. Just trust me. And I don't have time to get into all the story because I only got five minutes because it's a great story and it's a true story. We didn't have any place to meet. The, the, the buildings were totally wiped out. I had a church call me. I took the first, first person that called me and said, y'all can meet here. We had to meet at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That wasn't fun. But they had enough space for us to meet, just barely. And they let us use their Sunday school space. And then another church called me. A little bit later, they had more space, so we moved eight miles away and began to meet in that building and have Sunday school in that building. We really grew a great friendship with a, another Baptist church in the area, began to cooperate with each other. <coughs> but God provided us a place to worship. On Wednesday nights, we didn't have any place. So we met in the fire department, the Collinsville Community Club. A group of ladies met in the Piggly Wiggly. We, we met in, in a workout studio. Um, every place that would let us meet, we met. We had children in one place, students in another place, adults in another place on Wednesday night. We made it work. And people didn't gripe or complain. It, it kind of became fun after a while to see what God was going to do next. People were joining the church. I remember when this lady joined. She was standing down here back in the days we used to bring you down that. I said, I finally went, y'all know we ain't got nothing, right? Just like that. And she goes, yeah, I know. Whole place laughed. People were joining. The church was growing. And we were like, wow, what is God doing here? But that church, through that storm, became more outwardly focused in reaching people. I had people stand in line at the grocery store going, hey, do y'all have a church home? Why don't you come to our church? It's amazing. They never did that before. We began to give. They began to give and serve more than they ever, been. They ever did. They began to give. They didn't have anything, but they were giving. They gave so much, we paid the building off in 14 months after we rebuilt. Never used one dime of tithe money to pay for that note. Not one. People were joining the church. We, we were getting buildings done. We were working really hard. And I had groups of people working, and they were working feverishly. It was an amazing time in the life of our church. But we truly thought in the very beginning it was all going to fall apart and everybody was going to leave. They were just going to take the easy way out and go somewhere else. But absolutely the opposite happened. And I saw that church that, you, it's a church like Flint would have been back in the day. Out away, it's more country. 
And we begin to see them grow. And God used that storm to grow his people and to teach them to trust him. And when the thing, and when it was all over with, when the storm was over and the building was built, they didn't stop reaching people. They, they, they didn't stop giving. They didn't stop trusting. They didn't stop inviting. They continued that. And the greatest thing we discovered is that the church is not a building. You are the church. Whether you have a building or not, you are the church. You are God's people gathered together to worship him and to give him worth. I can honestly say that storm was used to grow the whole church full of people so that they would know that Jesus is the son of God and we can trust him. Now, my question is this, what storm are you going through or what storm will you be going through before you know it? If you hadn't been through a storm, you're going to go through one. How are you going to react? How are you, how are you going to respond to that storm now that you know that God has sent that storm to grow you in your faith so that you'll learn to walk with him and trust him and say, okay, God, I know you got this and I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid because my God is trustworthy. Do you truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Your Savior, the one you put your faith and trust in, he's truly the Son of God. And he is sovereign over you, over everything about your life, even the hard stuff.